Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Um, we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show, and it is posted to our website afterwards, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can see our archives. We post a recording of the show itself onto the Nebraska Library Commission's YouTube account, and if there is a presentation, as there is with this one, any slides or handouts, they also get posted along with the um, recording as well. So if there is anything in this presentation, I have not previewed it myself um, with like URLs or things you want to note down. Um, don't worry about having to try and scribble down all that information. These slides will be made available afterwards with along with the archive. Um, both our uh, live show and our recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So uh, there's no passwords. You don't have to be a Nebraska library staff person or something. So please do share um, our website with any of your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live. So um, hopefully there's something for everybody who is library related. We do book reviews, interviews, uh, mini training sessions, demos of services and products. Um, anything that we um, find out out there that has to do with libraries that is really our only criteria is that something library related. Uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the library um, state library agency for all libraries in the state. So we have things for public, academic, K-12, correction facilities, museum libraries, uh, anything if it's a library, we're here for you and we'll have sessions, we'll have shows on about that. Uh, we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do do presentations for things that we are offering here through the Library Commission or services um, that services that we want to promote. Um, but we also bring in guest speakers. That's what we have this morning with us. We have kind of a team thing going here, as you can see from our camera view. Um, with us this morning is Corrine Jacox. Good morning, Corrine. Good, Good morning. Um, she's from the Creighton University Law Library, and then. Um, up in Omaha is Yumi O'Hara. Good morning, Yumi. <laughs> and she is from the UNO, New Univi yeah. University of Nebraska Omaha, Chris Library. And they have a presentation they did together. This is session um, best practices for digital collections. And this is something that was done most recently at our Nebraska Library Association and School Librarian Association's annual conference. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a very well attended session. And obviously digital collections is a big topic. So I, of course, invited them to come on the show to share um, more and more widely um, what they presented. So I will just hand it over to you, Corinne, since okay. you have control of the presentation here to take it away. All right. So let's go ahead and get started here then. Um, when you are thinking about um, starting a digital collection, um, one of the things to remember is why are you doing this? So you create these collections to create new research opportunities for users. It makes it available to them and, and to a, a wide variety of people and it allows them to enhance their understanding of these digital objects that you're putting in the collection. But before you actually uh, dig or you know start that scanning or whatever, taking photos, you need to do a lot of planning. And the more time you spend planning, the better the rest of the project will go. So this is an important step in the process. So think about um, your institution's mission and goals. Does this collection fall under the institution's mission and goals? And if it doesn't, perhaps it's not something you should pursue. What are the costs and capabilities that you have for long-term maintenance? Some projects can go on for a long time. And will you have the staff and money to do that? So that might stop a project early on. Think about um, the standards that you want to follow for a project and you're going to put together documentation for those standards. You're going to decide what formats you're going to use for the digital objects and what type of metadata are you going to be using uh, to describe these digital objects. What is the timeline that you, you know, when do you want to start? How long do you think it will take? What's your goal for when you want it to finish? Define your scope. 
And this is going to be based a lot on the characteristics of the objects that you're digitizing. For example, how many, uh, what formats, again, are you going to use? What are the sizes of these objects? Are there unusual characteristics about them? And what's the condition? If you're working with really fragile objects, that's going to kind of change how you do things. You're going to work out your workflow um, for the project and then think about the equipment. And you want to use the equipment available to you to provide uh, the best quality and level of production. If you're lucky enough to, um, you know, have money to buy new equipment, that's great. Mm -hmm. But many times you, you make it work with what you have. Also part of planning. Um, and this can apply to individual collections. Individual collections can have their own policies. But um, if you have a wider institutional uh, repository, you're going to have policies for the whole institutional repository as well. So some of the policies that you need to put together are access. Who are you going to allow to access these collections? Or individual collections might have different access policies. What kind of content are you going to be putting into your institutional repository? At Creighton, um, the Health Sciences Library, the Reinert Alumni Re Library, and the Creighton Law Library share an institutional repository. We use DSpace for mm -hmm. our platform. Um, and so we have a committee set up between the three libraries. And we have a policy for the committee. For example, you know, who's the chair? When will that rotation? You know, how long are they chair? Who's, um, other things like that. Um, and then what kind of copyright policies are you going to follow? What kind of metadata policies are you going to establish? What about preservation? And withdrawal, what if somebody asks you to remove something from your collection? You want a policy set up ahead of time so you know what you're going to do. So at the bottom of the slide here, I have examples of um, a couple libraries and what their policies are. So the first one is the University of Chicago Library. Um, so here they talk about contributors to their repository, what kind of content, what kind of content, the content types they'll put in their repository, file formats, and so forth, withdrawal, copyright. University of Hawaii at Manoa Library. This policy is more like a collection development policy, but I thought it was very interesting and it's very well developed. So um, that's worth taking a look at as well. Now you mentioned with your library that you have multiple libraries, like a committee. Is there a lot of conflict among each group of what they think they what they want, or do you guys, you know, we work, work together well, pretty well. well. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I think depending on, like you said, depending on which library it is, they're going to have different reasons for having it. I mean, all of this is going to vary, not just, I mean, from institution to institution, but like here's the other multiple libraries, you know, library to library. Yeah. Well, and that's why early on we developed a policy for um, what kind of content will we take into the repository and things like that. And that mm -hmm. has helped a lot yeah. along the way. <clears throat> And it's kind of like, you know, if somebody comes to you with, well, I'd like to digitize this, you know, we just, well, that, does that fit into, you know, Creighton and what we would want to put out there and that type of thing. And that, that sure. really kind of helps yeah. drive, drive mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. Yumi, do you have anything to add to that? It should be in You mean, did you have anything to add? No. Okay. No? Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. We'll just go past those. Another the thing to think about is your staffing. And here's a list of possible roles. 
um, that I found from the Lucidia Think Clearly blog. That doesn't mean you have to have all these people. Most of us aren't going to have this these <laughs> this many people. <laughs> That's a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, and um, also, but the people you do have will probably wear multiple hats here. And it kind of what I liked about it is it kind of laid out the different kinds of things you have to think about that need to be done as you're doing um, a digital collection. Of course, you need some kind of a project manager who oversees the project um, and keeps it on time and watches the workflow. You could have a collections assessor. This is the person selecting the originals. Again, that probably for most of us would fall back onto the project manager, actually. Um, you can have a database manager. As you're digitizing things, you might have a database you're keeping off on the side to organize all this before you actually put it into your repository or whatever web platform you're going to put this on. You're going to have, you will, will have scanning technicians. These are the people who are handing the, handling those objects, creating the scans or taking the photos and that sort of thing. For us, this is students, and I think they would love it if we actually called them scanning technicians. <laughs> um, a quality control technician, somebody who's going to check those files and make sure they're OK. A cataloger, this is the person who's creating that metadata. And of course, I, of course, think that's a very important role. <laughs> and then um, a web manager or maybe a system administrator who is um, designing and maintaining where the this project's going to sit. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about metadata a little more. Um, I talked about you need to create a metadata policy and you're going to think about, well, what elements do you want to include in your digital collections? So what is metadata? And the definition we hear all the time is data about data, and that's not all that helpful. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but if you think of it in terms of it's um, a description and context of the data, it helps to organize, find, and understand the data. But if you look at this uh, little image to the right, the Lego block, and the, if the, the block itself is the content, those little nodules on the top are the metadata that help you get to that content. Well, that's a nice visual representation of that. Mm -hmm. I like that, yeah. It's For not, someone who's not a cataloger by, yeah, I, I, I've cataloged a few things in my career, but it's not my main yeah. focus, yeah. And that's not my original idea, but I, <laughs> but I thought it was a great way to yeah. describe metadata. You want to use a recognized standard. Uh, of metadata, and that, that is really important if you're going to migrate your data at some point. You want to have a standard that will migrate easily. And there's no stand, no single standard can cover all types of materials for all users, so you might end up using multiple metadata standards. There are three types of metadata, descriptive, administrative, and structural. So we'll look at each of one of the, each one of those in a little bit more detail. The first one is descriptive metadata. This describes the resources for discovery and identification. And it includes elements such as title, abstract, author, and so forth. I don't need to read it all through all those for you. But for example, a title. How are you going to enter your titles? Are you going to just capitalize the first word and pronouns? Are you going to capitalize like you would a title of a book? Those are things you need to decide so you're consistent. Are you going to add an abstract? What about author? So are you going to enter your author last name, first name? Or are you going to enter them the way you see them? Or are you going to file, follow some kind of authority control? Um, so that if you look up a person, they'll all come together under one nice result. And then also dates. How are you going to enter dates? Are you going to do month, year, month, day, year? Are you going to do day, month, year? Are you going to do year, month, day? Um, with months, are you going to spell them out? I mean, there's all kinds of things to think about. But you want to work towards consistency. So you make your decision, and then that's what you follow. And uh, subjects, if you're going to include subjects, what kind of thesauri are you going to follow to do that? So some of the general standards uh, for metadata scheme schemas that you can use are Dublin Core, uh, 
There's also mods. There's Mark. And then um, you can, there are also some standards for special descriptions. So like data sets has um, its own schema. Um, archival materials can have their own schema as well. Now, is this something, you now metadata is not obviously specific just to, I mean, we're talking about digital collections ultimately mm -hmm. here, but is this something that most libraries would, most places would just use your standards that you set up for your traditional materials or would, I mean, does that, so that everything, if everything is across their whole online catalog world the same or do something different because it's digital rather than an actual book in hand? Uh, well, some I mean, of the some of the metadata is certainly different because of the digital aspects. Other things you need to the, the talk things about. you have true, to add. True, right. And it, I mean, think of it in terms of like for cataloging, uh, what what we follow for metadata is RDA. Right. Yes. So um, for this, there are other ones that you can follow, or mm -hmm. it's the backbone of what you're putting it into really here. Mm -hmm. So Mark um, right. could, you know, like what we use for cataloging, but like for DSpace, what we use at Creighton, it's Dublin Core. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's the backbone, what you're putting the metadata into. And so yeah. it has kind of its own things that you follow. Right. Administrative data provides information to help manage a resource. So what does that mean? Well, this tells you things like when and how it was created, your file types, technical data on creation and quality control. And this is really important, um, again, for migrating and long-term sustainability of a, a digital collection. Um, administrative data also includes who can access the collection. So some sample elements of what kind of metadata this is, is over on the right. And then there can also be some subsets of administrative metadata, such as rights management, which is your intellectual property rights, and preservation metadata. So this is information needed to archive and preserve a resource. You know, not only do we reserve our tangible, our paper things, but once you start these digital collections, you're gonna to wanna to be able to reserve those digital, preserve those digital objects as well. And then finally, there's structural metadata. Um, so on the right, again, are some sample elements of what goes into structural metadata. This is the metadata that facilitates navigation and presentation of electronic resources. So for example, it provides information about the internal structure of resources, like the pages, chapter numbering, and so forth. It can also describe the relationship among uh, among materials like photograph B was included in manuscript A, that sort of thing. And um, an example of this uh, kind of metadata that can be used for this is METS. So here are some sample uh, metadata policies that have been put together. I'm not going to click on all of these. And All the links will be available when you get access yes. to the slides. And notice at the bottom is actually the Nebraska Library Commission's yeah. memories, Memory, Nebraska yeah. memories. Um, but a lot of these I found would kind of lead back to the first one, ah, <laughs> the Mountain okay. West digital. You know, a lot of people use that as a resource for themselves. So um, to give you an example of, the, uh, we're just going to take a brief look at the Mountain West digital library. Uh, best practices, and that might be a little hard to read, but this is like their table of contents. So um, if you go down to part three, there you see the different element tables. That's not all of them, but these are the elements that they use. And then, for example, then we'll take creator, and then this is what the individual element looks like and what they say about it. So the label, uh, the definition, so you know how you should be using it, is it a required field? Is it repeatable? More about how to use it and so forth. So these are the kinds of things that help you decide um, how to use your metadata and where to put it. So to talk about metadata a little more, um, this is one of the collections we have at the Creighton Law Library. It's the Delaney T Tokyo paper, Papers. These were um, some papers that were donated to us by an alumni from 1930, um, Thomas Ronald Delaney. 
he was on the prosecution team in the Tokyo trials, mm -hmm. particularly the Tojo trial of that. So these papers he donated to us were, um, although some of them are in other digital collections, we had some unique materials, even though our collection is very small. So let's go ahead and go to the collection. So the front end of the collection is in a live guide, actually, that's what this is. And um, you can read more about the Tokyo trials and so forth, but if you actually want to browse the collection, you can. And we only have like 24 or 25 objects in the collection. So the one I wanna look at more specifically is 2988, this one. So from here, you can read a brief description of the document. And then if you click here, it will actually take us, now we're in DSpace. We're in our institutional mm -hmm. repository. So um, this is how it displays. This is the metadata that displays. So um, if there were authors associated with a document, like the attorneys involved in that sort of thing, the dates, um, subjects, and in this case, um, the thesaurus I, I chose to use for subjects was the FAST subject headings. Um, this refers to um, a finding tool that they have at the University of Nebraska at, in Lincoln here that was very useful to help me figure out what these documents were. So I, am, I included that as well. Um, and then, so that's a, Oh, I wanted to point out, here's the rights management, um, how people can use these documents. So that's what you see up front, but there's more metadata behind the scenes. So this is some of that administrative data and things like that. <clears throat> so for example, here is an element for table of contents. <clears throat> you can see it's quite lengthy and it's not displaying out front but we included it because it helps for keyword searching. Um, let's see here, what else? Um, these fast headings, so this is, you know, what I'll call it the iReadable part of the subject heading, but then this is the, the link da data portion of it. So someday I have, I'm hoping that putting all this behind the scenes will help pull pull this out for people. Mm -hmm. And then also this collection, <clears throat> because it's so archival and um, that type of thing, we did include information about what did we scan this on, what DPI was it at, and that sort of thing. Okay. Oh, I don't want to do that. Um, I went too high. I want to go right here. Well, did you want to just go over to the of the still in the collection or go back to your slides? I want to go back to my slides. Oh, then you can close everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can. That's just can all I? the browsers. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll skip through these. This is my emergent, my backup kind of thing. <laughs> all right. Always have a backup in yes. case the internet decides to be <laughs> you know, difficult. <laughs> and uh, the last thing I want to talk about is privacy. So think about privacy when you're creating these collections. You're going to have things in your collections about individuals and their private lives. And you're putting it out there for the world to see. So I found this from the Society of American Archivists. And you wanna establish procedures and policies to protect your donors, um, your individuals and groups, and all those types of things that are in these holdings. You know, you, you're wanting to put the historical record out there, um, but be sensitive to the privacy of what you have. Some documents, of course, are more sensitive than others. You, it, mm -hmm. might, it might mean that you're gonna put access restrictions on a collection. And also think about your users' rights to privacy, you know, um, just like we mm -hmm. do in libraries in general. Uh, you know, that's another thing to think about. Mm -hmm. So an example I have of this, the first collection we started with was the Nebraska Reefs collection. Mm -hmm. We started this into that collection in 2010, and we have cut our teeth on this collection. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've learned a lot from it. Um, so these are briefs that are filed with the Nebraska Supreme Court and the Nebraska Court of Appeals. And there are some 
things in those documents that some people don't want. There's going to be, yeah, yeah personal, they don't. Yes, yeah. personal information. And so when we started this project, um, that never occurred to us, honestly. And we, we started getting requests, would you please take that out? We don't mm -hmm. want people to see this about now, me. Is that stuff, is that public record though? It is public record. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And we had conversations with our university council and they were saying mm -hmm. it's public record, you're, you know, you're within your Fine. rights to do yeah. this. But we were also sensitive to what this was doing to people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes people move beyond bad things in, that have happened in their life and they don't. They just, you know, they want to go beyond that. And there's public record as in you'd have to like go to the courts to search on purpose. Mm -hmm. And then there's this where it is <clears throat> when you're putting these digital collections out onto the Internet. It's like depending on how well you've done your metadata and whatnot, easily just Googleable by yes. somebody who looking up someone's name or right. event or something. And it's yeah. a little different. Yeah. Making it more broadly and easier to access. Right, yeah, the, it's out there. new world that we're in with <laughs> And Internet, Google picks yeah. up so much. Yeah. And it and it, what, and uh, it wasn't the metadata so much, but Google actually goes in and searches those PDFs. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing we, <clears throat> we did was it was possible to add uh, meta tags to the collection to tell Google, please don't go into the PDFs. And that worked for a long time, or that worked pretty well. Um, I will say our policy was to not remove the documents mm -hmm. because this was part of the collection. Mm -hmm. um, and then about a year ago or so, we were starting to get takedown requests again. Mm -hmm. And it was like, well, is Google not staying out of the PDFs now? Yeah. So um, we have now had to lock down the collection. So um, to the point of the collection itself is actually searchable. The metadata is still actually searchable. You can access the collection, but then if you want to open a PDF, you either have to have a login or ask us for the document. Mm -hmm. So now Google can't get to those PDFs anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of our balance mm -hmm. with this collection. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's, that sounds typical of Google is trying to get people access everything it can find that's out there on the internet and obviously something changed that we need to be able to access it's out there mm -hmm. so let us get to it and yeah. they figure out a way to get around right. um, and it, yeah it is a balancing act what the what the person who it's about wants to do what you as an institution your rules and what you're just you're, you wanted that mm -hmm. PDF to never be searched and indexed by Google and Google saying we're just want to show everything well, yeah. you know, we should be <laughs> deferring yeah. to the people who are owning this site and putting it out mm -hmm. there what they want to do and let them do, mm -hmm. put the restrictions on it they want to. That's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that's something you got to keep an eye on then too, because right. if things do change, they're always updating and changing their algorithms and how yeah. their search works. So you can't just do this as a one shot and think no. you're done. Yeah. yeah. That's right. It's never done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Yumi, I'm going to go to the next slide. Are you ready? Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep, you're hey. good. Okay. Okay. So uh, next, uh, I'm going to talk about the best practice involved in the digital process, focusing on the uh, workflow and long-term digital preservation uh, challenges. So uh, on the slide, those are overall steps of uh, digital process. Uh, so first, uh, we receive digital requests uh, indicating the uh, information about the uh, selected materials uh, to digital digitize. Uh, second, we scan those materials and create a digital object or digital files of the materials. Then third, uh, edit or convert those digital files. Then uh, preserve those digital files in the storage. And the last step, uh, make uh, digitized materials available online. Uh, slide, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so workflow, uh, systematic workflow help us to do the efficient and effective uh, digital process. Uh, UNO library uh, use um, that tool called Fixit, which is based on the uh, OS ticket system. Uh, when um, digital project or new project come to us, for example, scan materials and creating a digital object for online exhibition. 
uh, we receive a ticket as a digital request via that uh, fixed system. So that ticket includes information about the materials and also resolution or DPI uh, of the scanned images. Next slide, please. Then, uh, regarding the resolution of the scanned images, UNO use that resolution chart uh, showing on the slide. So, as you can see, scanning resolution depends on the format and the size of the original materials. So, for example, 35 uh, millimeter slide uh, use uh, 4000 dpi, and the uh, regular document uh, use uh, 400 dpi. So importantly, even though the original size of the item is large, such as a map, uh, if the content of the item includes a lot of uh, detailed information, uh, I would use a higher resolution uh, for those types of item uh, than the DPI shown on the uh, resolution chart. Uh, next slide, please. So after scanning and creating digital object of the materials, we currently save uh, those digital files in three different formats. Our uh, first um, unload TIFF file, which is an uh, unaltered, uh, I mean master file. A master file is preserved uh, as a long-term archival record. A second format is an unedited TIFF file, uh, which is a derivative file. A derivative file is used for editing and enhancement and conversion to different format. And the last format is an um, uh, edited JPEG file, uh, which is an access file. Access file is uh, mainly an image used for um, detailed on the screen viewing and also uh, user interact with uh, that image. So when we save digital file, um, what name would we give those uh, files? So file naming conventions, file naming standards uh, for digital collection are much discussed topic among people who are uh, working with digital like us. So because um, there is no standard, uh, I mean standard do not exist. Uh, each library has a different collection and the different materials. So how can we start a common file naming convention for a digital collection? So on the slide, it's just an example of the file naming convention. As you can see, it's still complicated. And um, we don't see, or we cannot see, uh, which digital file is which item or collection has been digitized. Next slide, please. Um, when I just started working here, uh, I create file naming uh, rule for our materials. So, but uh, while working with the uh, digital process for various types of collection and materials, uh, I realized that it's really still very difficult to uh, following that rule or apply this uh, file naming rule for uh, all materials or all collections uh, because each material is different, and also uh, materials in the collection differently organized from other collections, such as uh, item level or folder level or box level. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this May, I attended the digital preservation workshop, Power. I highly recommend uh, this uh, workshop. Uh, so at the power workshop, I shared my uh, problem or uh, issue regarding a file naming uh, convention, file naming standard uh, with a uh, team member, my team member, or uh, and also my consultant who helped improve or, or create our uh, digital preservation plan. Uh, their answer was uh, very simple. Uh, they just advised uh, do not spend much time for file naming convention because each material is different, each collection is different from others. So, uh, but um, we need to minimum file naming convention at least. Um, and also, uh, for example, when we receive uh, actual uh, new collection, then we can decide depends on the what materials contain in this uh, collection, in the uh, project. 
So for example, um, on the slide, this is just an example. Start with a collection ID and using a underscore or a space. Uh, do not use space. I highly recommend, especially when you're working on the uh, batch process. So um, underscore or other letters to help readability. So uh, anyway, just to keep in mind, file naming is uh, uh, should be make sense over time and keep it simple. Next slide, please. So uh, if the materials which you have digitized is a document type of materials, I mean consist of multiple pages, after scanning all pages and creating a digital object or digital file of each page, then combine uh, JPEG uh, digital images into a single PDF file. So then you will uh, want the OCR, the PDF document. Uh, OCR plays a vital role in the uh, digital process for the types of document materials. Uh, OCR helps to reduce the size of the document and also uh, help to support searches in any text word. Then after OCR, you can save the OCR the PDF document as per the requirement. So here is a question. Which format, PDF or PDF-A format, would you save the PDF document? Or when you receive PDF document in born digital, uh, and uh, that the document include digital signature or a uh, link to the external website or a link to the external uh, document. Uh, especially if your PDF has a link to the external website or external document, um, it's not good for long-term archiving uh, because uh, you cannot be absolutely sure that that website or document uh, will exist uh, even 10 or 20 years from now. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what is PDFA? Uh, PDFA format is a PDFA, a PDF ISO standard format uh, that support archiving of file uh, for future use. So PDFA format allows the productivity of file in that they can be opened by uh, any software or operation system uh, without losing its format, uh, color, hypertext, font, uh, digital signature, and other information. Uh, especially PDFA format is a format that ensures that external content such as a website or document can be reproduced exactly um, same way, uh, regardless of uh, what uh, tool or software is used. Next slide, please. So, Yumi, I might not be on the right slide. Is this the slide you want? Yeah, I think so. She was talking about PDFA? Yeah. Ah, yes, ah, sorry. <laughs> So uh, it seems PDFA format is actually excellent format for long-term preservation. Um, but here are the things probably you want to know that. So there have been many controversies and then issues surrounding PDF and PDFA format. Uh, for example, that uh, report, NDSA uh, report, the benefit and the risk of the PDF3 file format for archiving institutions. Uh, this uh, report gives an uh, uh, excellent overview of the issue surrounding the PDF and the PDF format. So in that report, they say that the PDF has a number of advantages, especially in terms of encapsulation. But a PDF format could be very bad. Uh, depends on the what content your original PDF document contains. Uh, for, is, for example, if your original document contains uh, things that uh, PDF disallow, such as a uh, 3D or JavaScript, uh, process for PDF will discard those things or uh, replace those things with something uh, which is not good. So discarding the original document and keeping only a PDF uh, document uh, could be very bad idea. Uh, but so it depends on the content of your document. So 
Uh, and when you are looking for a PDF or PDF as support, it's important to determine uh, what content your document contains and also what are your archiving needs. So here's another thing uh, I would like to share with you. Um, it's about uh, institutional repository hosted by um, BPRES. Uh, it's a digital common system. Uh, one of the digital common system function is to automatically generate a PDF cover page, uh, which, be, which can be customized. So for example, uh, you can add institution logo uh, to the cover page uh, as part of the layout. Then uh, when you upload a document uh, to the system, that cover page uh, would be automatically attached to the uh, document. Uh, but if the document is in PDF format, that cover page cannot be attached to the document. So I mean that function doesn't work uh, for the PDF uh, format document. So uh, when you upload a document to the uh, digital common system, you need to make sure your document is not in PDF format. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, next, uh, when you store uh, or preserve your digital object, uh, what media uh, would you use for this? And also, how would you store, how would you preserve those digital objects in long-term uh, repository? So here, I would like to share uh, that rule, a uh, three, two, one uh, rule to preserve a digital object. And this slide also showing the plan for file and folder management at UNO libraries. I mean, how to manage, how to preserve digital object with existing and available system in the library. Uh, we use a NAS drive. And uh, in the library NAS, uh, there's two area. Uh, student uh, working area and access store area. Uh, the student working area is for saving digital object created by a student. Uh, our student scanning many materials and saving uh, those digitized materials in TIFF format as a uh, master file and save those master files in that area. And also student edit and convert those uh, digital files and save those files in JPEG format uh, as an access file in that uh, student area. Uh, all digital files are organized by uh, digital collection and also uh, collection level. So after project is complete, make a copy of master file and uh, also uh, access file and save those uh, both files in access storage area. Uh, at that time, run checksum to ensure those uh, files are not correct or changed. Uh, also make a copy of access file and save those access files in a cloud storage or box. And also make a copy of master file and those master files uh, in the uh, dark archive. We use uh, Amazon GlassShare uh, as a dark archive storage. Next slide, please. So when saving or preserving a, a master file in dark archives, uh, our digital preservation plan can include create and save preservation metadata. So as uh, Colin uh, just explained, metadata typically is defined data about the data and they are uh, three different types of metadata, which are descriptive metadata, uh, administ administrative metadata, and structural metadata. So what is preservation metadata? And what is different uh, differences uh, between preservation metadata and those three types of metadata? Uh, actually, there is no clear line between what is preservation metadata and what is not. Uh, but the purpose of preservation metadata is to support the goal of long-term pre digital preservation, uh, which are to maintain the availability, uh, identity, uh, persistence, uh, rendability, uh, understandability, and authenticity of digital object over a long period of time. Next slide, please. 
So here is a list of five major areas uh, relevant to preservation metadata. Uh, first, prevalence. Uh, who has ownership of the digital object? Mm -hmm. uh, second, authenticity. Is the digital object what is proclaimed to be? Uh, third, uh, preservation activity. What has been done to preserve a uh, digital uh, object? So uh, this is very important because digital object can be easily edited or changed uh, accident. So this happens uh, when, for example, uh, when a digital object is migrated uh, from one format to another format in order to keep pace with the technology uh, change. So for those reasons or any other reason, it's essentially important to document how the digital object has been uh, migrated uh, over time, by whom, and for uh, what purpose. And the uh, technical environment, what is needed to render, interact with, and use the digital object. Uh, because digital objects are technology dependent, so it's very important to carefully document the technolog technological environment of an archived digital object to ensure it remain usable for current and uh, next generations. Then lastly, uh, light management. Uh, what intellectual property light must be observed? Uh, because digital objects are bound by intellectual property right, so describe who own and who can use a specific uh, file or object. Next slide, please. So uh, digital preservation is an ongoing activity. So I would like to share this NDSA level of preservation. Uh, you can download download uh, this uh, table uh, in the PDF format, clicking uh, this link on the slide. So anyway, uh, when you set a uh, realistic goal for uh, your digital preservation plan, I would recommend you to use uh, this chart and determine which level of digital preservation you are at with your collections. So for example, you know, we probably level one or less than level uh, one, but that is okay. So it's important to keep track of your uh, digital preservation activity as one move up uh, each of those uh, categories from current level to the next level uh, in enhan enhancing our uh, digital uh, preservation um, system or workflows. Next slide, please. So to make digital materials accessible, uh, the last step is select the proper system or select a proper digital platform for uh, making your digital collection accessible online. So you know libraries using uh, um, content DM platform, uh, Omega.net platform, and Bibles digital common platform to present our digital collections. So those platforms are part of our library's effort to uh, build and maintain unique uh, digital collections and provide online access. So select, uh, selection of digital platform can be a challenge to make uh, your digital collection more visible and accessible. So uh, we need to assess or we need to understand uh, how and what uh, we want to uh, present um, digital uh, content and also uh, we need to understand the digital content characteristic uh, digital platform the system functionalities and also our institutional system capability next slide please so uh, i would like to introduce one of the highlights of our digital collection at the uno libraries uh, it's uh, um, the uh, UNO oral history collection. Uh, we are currently sharing over 200 uh, oral history interview materials. So all oral in interview materials are presented on the content DM platform and also our uh, Omeka.net platform. So on the uh, Omeka.net platform, using the Omeka's function, we organize and present those uh, oral history items by collection such as uh, LGBTQ uh, oral history collections, uh, Native American oral history collections, and also by subject, 
such as a、uh, World War II immigrant or Native American and LGBTQ,、uh, so that the user can find a specific item from,、uh, from the Omega、uh, platform. Next slide, please. So, our oral history items are created、uh, using、uh, OM system, oral history metadata synchronizer system. So, using this OM system, interview materials can be delivered together with a corresponding time tag and、uh, transcription or captions of the interview.、Uh, next slide, please. So, after making the digital item available online, so fix it. So, create a ticket as a cataloging unit、uh, by a fix it this system. So, that ticket includes a link to the digital materials on the、uh, digital platform, such as a Omega platform. So, through that ticket system, the digital unit and the cataloging unit、uh, can communicate with each other.、Uh, most importantly, to add the collection location to the finding aid in the system, such as the archive space, and to add the finding aid location、uh, to the metadata for the digital object on the、uh, platform, such as the Omega platform. I mean, This workflow can link a bit on digital collections and their finding aid so that the user can explore other relevant materials and also a、uh, user can find、um, what the physical collection actually contains, which is listed on the、uh, finding aid. So uh, now uh, Connie will conclude our、uh, presentation. Okay. That,、um, that ends our presentation. So, if there's any questions. Great.、Um, thank you, Yumi. That was a, a, great, a lot of, like I said, I'm not a cataloger, so a lot of that is beyond me, but it was very interesting to, to hear about it. And, and especially the,、uh, the PDF issues. I, did not, I was not aware that there's different types of PDFs that you had to be very, very、uh, concerned about. Yeah. <laughs> That could completely shut down what you're trying、mm-hmm. to do if you're not using it.、Um, so, if anybody does have any questions or comments or anything you want to share, type into the questions section of your GoToWeb or go to web on our interface, and either Corrine or Yumi can、um, answer your questions.、Um, is there anything else you, while we're waiting, so you have any questions, anything、um, else you wanted to share about what you, you're doing? I know we showed the.、Uh, Your website for the Tokyo, the Delaney Tokyo trial papers.、Right. Do we want to show the actual oral Omaha's collection? or? Sure, we can do、um, that. I'm not、Let's、sure、see. if you have a link in there to that or if we just can go to. I'm going to end this. Yumi,、mm-hmm. what is your URL for、uh, your oral history? Yeah, go ahead. What are the history?、Uh, Hang on a second, I got to get this open.、Yeah. Uh, can you go to the、uh, UNO Chris Library website? And、um, click archive and special collection. Yeah. And, and uh, please, uh, digital collection. The very bottom choice on that pull down is that might be. This one? Go down. Go down.、Uh, yeah, uh, digital collection. Ah, ah, ah. Little bit up. Which one? I'm sorry. Scroll up.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a digital collection. You will see. Digital. Digital collection. More, more up. More up. More up. 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 Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, here, there. there. You've、oh. gone down too far. You went past、okay. it a little farther. <laughs> yeah. And the、yeah. UNO Brown History Collection. There. Okay. And then、uh, click the browser. Okay. Yeah, anything、uh, you can click. Any of them? Okay. Yeah, any of them. Let's do this one. Then、uh, click next to the image. This、uh, personal、okay. figure.、Next. Right here? Yes. This is our own system. And、uh, 
and then I could start to play. Yeah, yeah. and the yeah. also yeah. Uh, using uh, this index. For example, you can click index uh, introduction. Okay, so you can break it down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, nice. So you can jump to a certain part yeah. of the video. Uh, That's nice. Any of them what, uh, as an example. Yeah. For example, early life, you can click. Yeah, click. Yeah. Then uh, play segment. Just click play segment. So uh, you can jump. And also, uh, you can uh, see the transcript also. Just a slide, uh, light side. There is an index. Oh, here. And, uh, yeah. Oh, it's even searching. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Index and the uh, transcript. Yeah. And so just a slide transcript. Yeah. There you can see transcript also. Oh, wow. That, that's really nice. Yeah. And also you can jump like a, a one minute, second minute, uh -huh. third minute also. Okay. Whatever you want. Mm -hmm. That's very slick. Mm -hmm. I think you said there's like 200 interviews in there. You could definitely get lost. Yeah, <laughs> I think. yeah uh, that the collection is a uh, growing and growing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, we do have a question that came in. Um, it's actually two questions from a person. Um, they want to know what platform is UNO using? I know uh, you said the yeah, D press. You're uh, using the uh, UNO using a content of the DM. And uh, content DM Omega dot net and the digital common B press digital common platform. Yeah. So they're using three platforms. Yeah. Depending so on this, the the project. Yeah. So you mean yeah? Well, how do you decide which platform you're going to use? Uh, the first uh, B press digital common is an institutional repository. So mainly mm -hmm. salary work, like a faculty paper or ETD or student or uh, some class project. Yeah. And the uh, content DM is a definitely uh, archival materials and special collection. Then omega.net, we use omega.net, for example, exhibition, more focus on specific project. So for example, LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ, no, a clear Omaha archive collection or a, a this oral history collection also. Omaha story, it's called Omaha stories. So, mm -hmm. and also uh, we have a big uh, collection, a uh, Chuck Hegel collection. So mm -hmm. Chuck Hegel collection, uh, they're using uh, Omega.net for some exhibition, as an exhibition presentation. Okay. So it's ultimately what your final mm -hmm. reason is for it, yeah. And then the second question that maybe for either one of you, um, do you have any recommendations for free or inexpensive platforms to do this? Is there anything open source, maybe? Well, DSpace is open source. There you go. Okay. Right. Um, but there's a big learning curve behind that. Yeah. And so that's going to come we, along with it. Yeah. We have a system administrator. Um, you know, I have to rely on this our system administrator and the other people that work with that to set up the collections mm -hmm. and then we can put the materials in. You know, we work together like, um, you know, I'll say this is the metadata I want to put in here and then they'll create the collection to make that work. Mm -hmm. um, so I rely on them to do that. Uh, I don't, Yumi, are there other open source? Um, uh, um, Omeka.net could be. Uh. Some some school using uh, Omega dot net platform um, as a repository. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Omega might have a, a version of it yeah. that's more open mm -hmm. source. Yeah. yeah. There's a couple of yeah, either the D space or Omega's certain particular version of it. Yeah. Yes. And also uh depends on manpower also which uh, repository we can handle. It depends on manpower also. Sure, sure. Yeah. So we use uh, because of this reason we use omega.net, not omega.org, because we cannot host. Ah, okay. So yeah, you if you have the servers to host that you're gonna do yeah. either the org or dot com, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, um I just want to throw one last <laughs> thing in. I think that most people probably already know, but make sure I mean Yumi talked about 
you should have three copies of your digital objects and so forth, but you need to have a backup of your system. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. not just the objects, but the whole, yeah, yeah the system the whole, yeah. So that's my last comment, I yeah. think. <laughs> Great. Oh, and the person asking is Allison said it would be a one woman powered. So she, yeah, yeah. she does need something that she can. It depends on how much work you want to put into. You try out Omega because it might be easier. Check out DSpace if you're willing to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know work that. It depends also possibly how big of a collection you're starting with. What you want to you know. Um, how much you want to put into learning DSpace. If it's just a small mm -hmm. collection, it might be okay to put a lot of your time into learning the system and then getting things started. And like anything, once you get going with it, once you've learned, like you said, learning curve, you'll just be able to do them and keep adding things once you get after, over that hump. Right, yeah. it's something real basic even. you. I mean, you could even do live guides. Yeah. You could do it in live guides, you know. You might not have some of the other features that some of these bigger systems have, mm -hmm. but if there's something you want to get out there, uh, it'll serve its purpose. It'll serve its purpose. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. It doesn't look like anybody has any uh, desperate questions they've typed in right now. We are a little after 11 o'clock, so about on our hour time, which is what we, we started a little after 10, so I think that's perfect. Um, if anybody does have any questions, um, both you, me, and Corinne, they're online at their very uh, respective universities. You can reach out to them with any questions. Um, and all of this information, of course, as we said, the recording and the um, slides will be up uh, posted with the archive. So um, thank you, Yumi, for being with us remotely. And thank you for yeah. showing up here at the commission to do this. Um, I think that we will then officially wrap up your presentation for now. I'm going to go to our website for uh, Encompass Live. And actually, I think this will go to, here we go. There we go. This is the Nebraska Library Commission's homepage. Uh, where we have our, um, under education, we have a link to um, Encompass Live webcasts. You can also search our site, or if you just, as we did, just Google our name, so far on the internet, we are the only thing called Encompass Live. Yeah. So nobody ever call yourself this. <laughs> <laughs> and so we just come up first in your search results. And this is where we have our upcoming shows. And so what I show you was the archive for today will be processed probably by the end of the day today, as long as YouTube and everything cooperates. It'll be available right here underneath our uh, upcoming shows is our archives, where it is just reversed. Uh, the most recent ones are at the top of the page. So here's the one from last week. We did our best new children's books of 2018 session. Those are links to the recording. And then there will also be a single link unlike this one from last week, we had multiple presentations to the presentation that, that Karina and you used today. So you have access to both of those. Everyone who attended today's show and who registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's available and ready to watch. Um, it also goes out to our regular social media as well, just announcing that it's available. And while I'm here, I'll show you, this is our archives. I was mentioning we have lots of resources, lots of sessions for different um, types of libraries. Uh, Encompass Live, this is uh, 2018, or oh, we're getting to the end of 2018. This is the 10th year of Encompass Live. Yeah, I know, when I did the math, I was a little stunned myself. <laughs> uh, but we do have all of our archives on this page. So if you scroll down, you will see things from previous years, 2014, all the way going back to the very first show in 2009. So do be aware when you are looking at through our archives, just look at the date. Everything is a date so you know exactly when it was actually broadcast live. And um, so take that in consideration. Some services and things we, pro we, we presented here may no longer exist. Links may not work anymore, mm -hmm. whatever, but um, we are librarians and we archive things, as yes. we were talking about today, yes. historical Absolutely. things. So as long as these uh, YouTube has our recordings out there, we have backups too. It's not our only, of course. Um, we will have our archives up there. Just pay attention when you are looking at some of our more older uh, sessions. Uh, watch for what the dates are. So that's all of our archives. I'm going to go back. So uh, that will be it for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic is, uh, we're also on Facebook. I should mention that right now before I pop off here. Uh, so if you're a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. We will post when our shows are coming up. Here's a reminder to log in for today's show. When our archives are available. No, I don't want to log in right now. Uh, when our recordings are up, we post on here. So if you do like to use Facebook and be up to date on things there, like us there and you'll push out and see our push notifications on there. So I uh, hope you join us next week when our topic is um, public library survey using Bibliostat. This is something that public libraries across the country are um, do every year, submitting their um, data to 
um, collect with all this data uh, uh, nationwide. But this is specifically about what we're doing here in Nebraska. We have a public library survey, we have a supplemental survey, we have some people answer some questions. So it, it, the survey did just open up at the beginning of November, so it is out there for our public libraries to start submitting. And if you want to hear more about it and see uh, what we're doing here and, and get some tips and tricks on how to use the new the interface, it has been updated, of course, as they do. Uh, Sam Shaw, who is our uh, stats person here at the Nebraska Library Commission, will be with me to talk about all of that next week so please do sign up for that and any of our other upcoming shows we are booked all the way through the end of the year um, oh I don't I just don't have the last day on it will be talking uh, the last session for de no, December um, I'm waiting for a special description but it'll be about our talking book and Braille service here at the Nebraska Library Commission some updates to that um, and then we book you things into January so please do join us for any of our future shows. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending um, and happy Thanksgiving. If you are traveling anywhere, be safe, drive safe mm -hmm. and uh, eat all you want. Yeah. You're not gonna say don't, go for yeah. it. It's a yeah. special day. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. And...